It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 261 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 23rd of April, 2017. My name is Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. So only two stories today, but they're good ones. And we're going to start off with a thought experiment. Think of Mr. Bigglesworth, the hairless cat that was Dr. Evil's pet in Austin Powers. Now shrink it down to about 10 centimetres long, make it blind, give it huge buck teeth, and make it just a little bit uglier. And you're looking at a naked mole rat. Oh, I thought you were going to say Tony Abbott. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hopefully... Tony Abbott does not live for an extraordinary long life like a mole rat does. I feel yeah, almost I bad saying will. this, but hopefully he does feel pain, unlike naked mole rats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're almost insusceptible to cancer, and they live in colonies like ants. And now, Penny, it turns out they can also survive for up to 18 minutes without oxygen. They are one of the weirdest animals on the planet. Yeah, and I have to say, and you took a lot of my, like, Did you know that's the way that I was going to lead with? But they are super weird. I wouldn't go far to say weirdest animals, but definitely weirdest mammals or weirdest mammal that I have ever encountered. They have a face. Can go with ugliest animal. How about that? Yeah, that only a mother could love. (laughs) Which they wouldn't because they're blind, so they wouldn't be able to see how ugly their offspring were. Mm. And something that seems to be relevant to their ability to survive without oxygen is their lifestyle. So instead of, I think apparently most, and I don't know a lot about naked mole rats as any naked mole rat experts listening in will be <laughs> very soon aware. But apparently most burrowing mammals tend to live sort of alone a bit or at least not mm-hmm. really, really densely. But naked mole rats live in really crowded burrows. So like, I think it's got sort of chambers the size of a few foot, a football, but they'll be just packed full of mole rats sleeping together. Mm-hmm. So this is why they they possibly evolved a low a low need for oxygen because these conditions can be quite low oxygen. Um, there's the oxygen supply in that situation really really drops to levels that other mammals wouldn't be able to survive, or at least other land mammals. So. I was, you know, you think of people trapped in a lift, that sort of horror movie kind of scenario. Yeah. So apparently the mole rats manage this by changing their metabolic system from one that's based on glucose to one that is based on fructose. Now, we've probably all heard of fructose in the context of diet, but it is just another another simple sugar that we – or we, you know, anything can get energy from. In humans, we we have excess fructose. We apparently usually store it as as fat, but the mole rat can use it as the start of the metabolic pathway to break down sugar and get energy out of it, which is usually done by glucose, which is really interesting. But um, it's not something that we can go, oh yeah, let's adapt that for humans because there's a whole lot of things that have to be different for it to work. Um, what I also found really fascinating was that the mole rats have a cooler body temperature. So their body temperature is about 30 instead of being warmer, like um, humans are about 37 degrees Celsius. And that also means that their metabolic requirements can be lower. I feel a little bit sorry for the rats. The way that the <laughs> um, first experiment was described is that oh, um, they gave them 5% Oxygen, the scientists who published this study, to see what the effects were. And essentially they were in, a, in an atmosphere with 5% oxygen showing no ill effects and the scientists just gave up and went home because they're like, well, they're fine. Well, they, did, they, they stopped the experiment, I think, and then they They stopped home. the experiment, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not gave up and went home, but you know what I mean. Whereas lab yeah. rats were, would have been dead within 10 minutes. Hmm. Even with there's no oxygen in the air, 
both the, um, sorry, not lab rats, sorry, lab mice, both mice and the mole rats lost consciousness, but the ordinary mice didn't recover. The mole rats could survive with no oxygen for 18 minutes and still recover. So as soon as they put some air back in after 18 minutes, they they sprang back to life. Yeah. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? It is. Um, because and I can see why it'd be useful, as you say, if you're in a low oxygen environment a lot, yeah. you develop, just through evolution, you develop lots of methods of coping with that, mm. uh, like this sort of suspended animation, I guess you'd call it, really. They sort of go catatonic, don't use any oxygen until there's some to use. So, very cool. It is cool. And it's really interesting because what I found fascinating was, well, that's interesting that they can do that, but why do they live in this structure like the way i read it was described they're almost like an sort of a social insect but they're mammals Mm -hmm. and apparently their food source is um this kind of tuber but there's not a lot of other food around but the tuber is extremely big and extremely rich but quite rare so if you find it if you're a mole rat and you find a tuber Mm -hmm. that is fantastic it's bonanza Mm -hmm. but it's hard to find one on your own so it's much better for a hundred mole rats to look for a tuber and then guaranteed a feast than one to just kind of yep. ferret around on its own. Which it's just, it's so fascinating. I just, it's such an alien kind of way of thinking <laughs> about how, how life works in something that, that is quite similar, like a mammal, just like us. Yeah. And that, um, that hive uh, social structure is also part of their thermoregulation because, as mm. you say, they're often th- they have a lower core body temperature. They don't thermoregulate like a lot of other animals do. They are uh, thermoconformers. Mm. So their body temperature is subject to changes in the outside environment. So if it gets really warm, they might go uh, burrow down deeper where it gets cooler. But if they get cold, they'll huddle together and use their collective body heat as well. So that social structure is an important on a number of different levels, which is kind of cool. It's fascinating, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so weird, ugly little animals, but could be potentially very, very useful. Like I said, they almost don't get any cancers. They don't feel any pain. Mm. And they live for a lot longer than most other rodents. They live for up to 32 years. So there's a lot that we can maybe, you know, gather from them and possibly even ways of breaking down fructose to survive without oxygen. Maybe that's a a much further uh, thing down the track, but uh, really, really cool and useful and we'll see what happens. Well, the Um, the naked mole rat in uh, Kim Possible always seemed to have lots of talents. (laughs) I haven't seen it. Dude! You have ah, got to fix that. What have you done Dude. with your life? <laughs> I you haven't have seen, seen either. Possible. True confession. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, everyone pause, pause <laughs> while they go and watch Kim Possible. While we go uh, and watch four a seasons. Few seasons to get through. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, all right, it's on the list. I uh, don't normally do cartoons, but all right. I'll watch it just for the <laughs> naked mole rat. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Uh, all right, Lucas, let's go into space now. And uh, for years now, we've talked about our nearest neighbour, the Alpha Centauri system. We've talked as though it were a trinary star system. Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri. But I guess we've never really known that Proxima Centauri was part of that star system until now. I guess we've just sort of thought it could be just passing by in the near neighbourhood. Is that the yep. theory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Sorry, you finished? Should I go? No, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> no, you go. No, you go. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah, that, that's right. E- evidence was certainly uh, um, strongly indicative that, uh, that that Proxima was was bound, gravitational bound to uh, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B uh, as, a, as another binary of, of stars, you know, pretty similar mass to our own sun. Uh, and of course, these are the ones closest to us, as far as we're aware. So, uh, I think um, we've got uh, something like 4.3 light years away. So they're, they're pretty close stars. In fact, Brian Cox talked about them a little bit on the uh, recent yes. uh, Stargazing Live in the first episode of. I think there were three episodes of that. So yeah. that was, yeah. um, he, and he mentioned that it was a, a trinary system on that as well. But uh, you know, that that has long been the assumption. 
but that's mm. really all it has been is an assumption because um, we, you know, long ago were able to measure the um, apparent uh, velocity of these these objects, how fast they're moving. In this case, towards us, they're moving towards us pretty pretty quickly, uh, something like 26 or so kilometers per second from memory. It may be a little bit more. Um, so, you know, they've, they've got a bit of a, uh, a clip, uh, 22, 22 point something kilometers per second they're moving towards us. But, uh, you know, the fact that the Alpha, and, or Alpha Centauri A and B uh, was moving towards us around 22.34 ish kilometers per second and Proxima Centauri is moving towards us something like 22.39 kilometers per second that's you know indicative that they're probably bound but there's also um, their their distance from each other uh, that, that's been uh, something to be very indicative and their distance for, from us um, so all of these things were you know basically they've been clumped as a, as a system for a long quite a long time and the reason that that we haven't known for sure is because typically to to figure out if things are gravitationally bound you need to observe their orbit for long enough to see what path they take um, so you know you, you think of the the uh, objects in our own solar system for example you know the the objects that are close in move quite quickly around this the star and you know you think of all of these uh extra uh, extra solar planets that have been found the the easy ones are the ones that go that are quite close to their to their parent star because they move around quite quickly so you know you need at least two detections to be able to say you know if you're using the most common methods uh, particularly the transit method where it goes in front and you see you watch for that dip in light uh, you need to see that happen a couple of times to be able to say okay mm. well it's it's a body of this mass and it's going at this speed and the size of its orbit is this and from that we can derive a lot of information but when when you're talking about you know stars like this, and, and I was actually really surprised, uh, you know, when I was reading um, uh, Phil Plate's blog posts about this, I was really surprised at how far away Proxima Centauri is uh, from Alpha Centauri A and B. I, I actually just had in my mind that it would be very, very close to it that you wouldn't really be able to see a, a gap in it, but it's quite mm. a it's quite a distance away. I mean, this is an extremely zoomed in image, but uh, it's still quite surprising how far away it is. So. The problem with, with that distance is the orbit is in the order of hundreds of thousands of years. So yeah, ah. <laughs> we, we can't sort of just sit around and wait even for a slight you know, percentage of that, that orbit to take place because there just hasn't been enough time uh, mm. and enough observations. So you know, that's why it's kind of been put in the category of, well, it probably is a trinary based on these other things that we know about the objects. So some astronomers went, well, you know what, we can actually figure this out because there, there are um, laws of physics that we can use to help us to, uh, uh, to, to do some, some calculations. And one of the things that we know about things in orbit and the things, and, and things in orbit that we have to um, uh, use uh, and, and, and figure out in order to escape orbits is, of course, escape velocity. This is something that's a consideration for rockets leaving our own, our, you know, our own, own Earth's, uh, Earth's orbit. They need to get to a certain speed in order to be able to escape the gravity well of the, of the Earth. And the same mm -hmm. is true here with, these, uh, with, with a system such as this. You've got these two you know, sun sort of mass stars that are sitting very close together and they, they create a gravity well, basically. A, you know, they, they, their mass is, is pulling on... Um, or, or not really pulling on, but warping space time. But that's a whole other thing. Let's just not yeah. get into the. <laughs> <laughs> but no. anyway, so um, you've got uh, you've got the gravity well created by these two things, and then you've got the Proxima that's whizzing around them, albeit incredibly slowly compared to the you know the space involved. So you could actually calculate if you had enough pieces of information what the escape velocity would have to be for Proxima Centauri to not be gravitationally bound to them because if you know its uh, relative velocity you know roughly its mass which we do you know roughly the the speed uh, uh, sorry the the direction in which it's traveling which we do uh, and and all, all three of these objects um, with those pieces of information you could actually figure out what what speed it would have to be going to not be gravitationally bound to these objects and that's exactly what they did and they basically sat down and they <laughs> they did the math and and what they found was that this this little this little guy proxima is uh, is traveling at a at a rate that is too slow to escape 
the orbit of the the other two uh, systems. So okay. it's very very cool. So basically, yeah. they found, and I won't go into all the, the maths of it because there were just <laughs> a, quite a, an amazing array of things that they had to take into account. Like even even they had to account for the speed of the plasma and gases rising to the surface of these stars because that affects the redshift calculations and, wow. and, or blue shift calculations. I mean, that, that, yeah, in this case, it would be blue shift <laughs> calculations, which is like, whoa, you know, and, and it adds up to something like 300 metres per second of, of uh, additional Doppler shifting because of the gases rising to the surface of the star. It's like, whoa, that is just mind-blowing. Um, so they had to account yeah. for that. And, and after they did, they, they figured out that uh, Proxima's basically moving faster than about 400, uh, sorry, 554 uh, uh, metres per second relative to El Centauri. Uh, sorry, if, if it was moving that fast, I should say. Um, if it was moving faster than 545 metres per second relevant, uh, relative to Alpha Centauri, then it wouldn't be bound to it. But what they did find was that it's moving only at about 293 metres per second, with an uncertainty of about 40 metres per second relative to the other two stars. And that means it has to be gravitationally bound, given the other things that we know about it. So I just, I, again, it, I'm often attracted to stories that kind of have this, I guess, detective situation of, of, of mm. pulling together all of these different pieces of, uh, of data and, and um, extrapolating from that. how we know, st- not so much what we know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's, that's yeah. the thing that always fascinates me is, you know, and we, we, had, a, we had that chat with... Uh, 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 Lucy with, Green? With, with Lucy Green recently, where yeah, exactly you, you you know exactly what I'm thinking. It's, it's that <laughs> it's that um, it's that the fact that we can derive so much just from light mm-hmm. is so cool. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, it's it's just mind blowing how much data we have about the universe. The vast majority of which is just based on light and the different ways of yeah. lengths of light and how we can extrapolate information from that. It's it's just very, very cool. And I think once you understand all of the ways that light can be used to give this information, it, it really enriches, I think, your appreciation of, of the scientific effort to, to mm. figure out this stuff. It's so, so, so cool. And the fact that then they, they have these multiple lines of intersecting and overlapping evidence which <laughs> confirm observations too. It's just uh, it's, it's very attractive to me. But also I think it's really cool that something as faint and far away, I mean, even though they're the closest neighbours to us, but they're still four light years away and Proxima yeah. Centauri is really small and faint, but they can get this sort of measurement to with an uncertainty of about 40 metres a second, which is a fairly small margin of error for when you're measuring 293 metres per second. I know. And they calculated that the chance of that being just a coincidence is oh, yeah. only one in 500 million. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I didn't ah. mention that, but yeah, that, that was so cool, wasn't it? It's like, yeah, this still could be chance, but it's really <laughs> unlikely. It's so unlikely that these things just lined up that way. And that's the thing. I mean, unless, unless things form together, they tend not to be, you know, on the same hmm. orbital plane. They tend not to be, you know, in the same... Um, uh, traveling the same directions at the same velocities. That's how we know that, you know, for example, um, clusters are, 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 you know, formed together more or less yep. uh, because because they, they, they have characteristics that are so similar that wouldn't otherwise be the case. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, you know, that, that ah. um, uh, the likelihood was so low. But And as you said, Proxima Centauri is so faint. It's a red dwarf. It's only about, I think, 1.2 size, times the sun's mass. Uh, sorry, 0.12, not 1.2. 0.12 times the sun's mass. Um, mm. and, and its diameter is something like 0.15 of the sun's mass. So this is a tiny, tiny object. Um, you know, in the, in the overall scheme of things. And that's the one, of course, that we, we think now that, uh, uh, quite, quite likely has, uh, a planet in a, in, a, in an orbital, uh, sorry, in the, in the Goldilocks zone, potentially of yeah, that an star. Which is, planet. Yeah. 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 Very, very cool. And also, I like that, as you say, you can then calculate backwards and say that Proxima Centauri is probably not a captured object and it was probably formed together. Right. That's also very, very awesome. Yes. Yeah, 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 and we see that um, based on objects just in in our own system, in the solar system. We can see there are certain moons that we know are, must have been captured just because of their orbit relative to the uh, rotation direction or rotation rate or the orbit of other objects around whatever it is. 
um, we know that certain moons of certain you know planets in the solar system must have been captured versus other ones that formed with it. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite it's quite cool how it all sort of you know plays out like a grand ballet. <laughs> Right, and a detective story, as you say, for us calculating all of that. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, and I think that's our show. If you want any more information about the stories we talked about or if you want to get in touch, just head to scienceontop.com slash 261, check out our social media pages uh, and leave a comment. And, of course, scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us out financially. We'd appreciate that. Thank you for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Rick. This episode was edited with fortuitous foresight by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. One of the great things about science is that it is an entire exercise in finding what is true. A hypothesis, you test it. I get a result. A rival of mine double checks it because they think I might be wrong. They perform an even better experiment than I did and they find out, hey, this experiment matches. Oh my gosh, we're onto something here. And out of this rises a new emergent truth. It does it better than anything else we have ever come up with as human beings. This is science. It's not something to toy with. It's not something to say, I choose not to believe e equals mc squared. You don't have that option. When you have an established scientific emergent truth, it is true whether or not you believe in it. And the sooner you understand that, the faster we can get on with the political conversations about how to solve the problems that face us.